Uh, so what we need to do is establish planes. So if you are a stage master, let's say you, you're, you're a director and you need to separate different levels of the stage from each other, what you have to do is think on a global scale. You have to start separating this ground, which is the mid-ground, from the foreground, okay, and then the background. What you've done here is you've lowered the, the, the horizon line pretty low. When the horizon line is low, does anyone know what it means when the horizon line is low? So let's say you're standing on the ground and this is you and you have a camera and this is the camera's view. In your, in your, uh, in your world, let's say you're even smaller, let's say you're this small. Let's say, you're, let's say you are this small. See that tiny little dot? In your world, the landscape is somewhere in the middle. If the canvas is this low, it means that you are what? You are at a high vantage point. Sorry, let me ban this motherfucker. Okay. <clears throat> you are at a high vantage point, exactly. So, if this person is supposed to be colossal, you as the stage master, as the photographer, as the cameraman, as the director, would you put the cameraman so high in the sky? What does that do? What does that do to your composition when you lessen the scale? You lessen the, there's a specific word, it starts with I, and the next letter is M, M. Does anyone know what it is? Alright, so it means that you are what? Immersion? Impact, exactly. You lessen the impact of the scale. The scale becomes less of the of a of a of a of an awe it has less of an awe factor than if you were lower on the canvas. So the image and the imposing scale of the skeleton would benefit greatly from a lower vantage point in the image. Thank you, Draken, as eloquent as ever. Um, we see this in uh, How to Train Your Dragon too. We see it a lot, but I'm not finding it. I'm so sorry. There's this one, but this one is kind of in the middle of one big scene. So this is not the introductory um, scene when we see that big, big guy. There's a scene when we see the really, really big guy and everyone's just looking up at him. We kind of see his belly. We also see this thing done with Godzilla. The emerging Godzilla. Sorry. Um... Where is it? It's in the movie. I guess this. <clears throat> the vantage point is low. This is not really useful. This is kind of a... I want to see the horizon line, but I can't see it. This is about why some of these images look so comical. Because the, there, there was no attempt at raising the horizon line. Everyone was just on eye level with the most large creatures you can imagine. And for some reason, the cameraman was eye level with the largest... I mean, is the, is the cameraman another Godzilla? But when you have the, the you have the, um, uh, uh, what's it called, Jurassic World T-Rex, when you have the, the camera low, you really get that effect. Okay, I'm not finding any of these specific scenes. They're really specific in the movie when they first emerge and you see the belly and you see the lower part of the neck and the horizon line is really, really high. It means you're really low on the ground and you feel very minuscule. And that's what you want to give, that impact of scale. It's really very important. So the first and most important thing is understand the power of your horizon line. Your horizon line is, this is not style, but, by the way, guys. This is all science. This is all basic design science when it comes to your composition. Please repeat everything that I just said because I want you to understand how important it is to memorize this stuff. Um, I'm never really using, doing a good job of, of listing them to you perfectly. I, I kind of want to just one day just make a big list of stuff to remember, the stuff that you can't mess around with, that you have to follow concretely. One day I'll get to it, I promise. But this is one of the biggest things. Please understand the power of your, of your horizon line and that this is all design sciences. This is not stuff that is malleable and changeable. When you lower the canvas, when you lower the horizon line on the canvas, you will make it feel like the person is, um, I mean, when you, when you lessen it, sorry, when you lessen it, it will feel like the person is not sort of, uh, f make the person feel like they're high. Now there's the fact that, 
Um, no, they're not. They're not high. Now there's the the talk about where the canvas is when you where the horizon is depending on the tilt of your head. So here, this horizon line can be for someone who's flying, someone who's standing on the ground. This will work. It just depends on where you place them along in reference to where the horizon line is. So this person will feel like they're flying because you're tricking the eyes into thinking this no longer has to do with the camera, this just has to do with us showing where they are along the horizon line. When you raise the horizon line all the way low, all the way, all the way up, let's try that, all the way up with this person looking down, now it feels like this person is really flying. But if you raise the horizon line all the way up, let's say you had a tree and you place someone down here. Now this feels coloss colossal and this feels not so colossal. So you have to understand what, where your character, it's not just about where the placement of the horizon line is. The horizon line can be all the way down here and the person could be flying. It's just where the camera is relative to them. So it's not just about your horizon line, it's about object A in relation to the horizon line. This is not style, this is basic, this is not style, this is basic science. The position of the horizon line is really important for the composition, like a physics formula book. Slides in, wow, we went out. What did I miss? <laughs> um, let's talk about horizon line placement and uh, its impact on the image. Thank you, Mbuto. So there's that. Please don't forget about the horizon line. There's a lot of talk about it, how to make someone fit. There's worm's eye view horizon line. Uh, so let's just try to, let's try to Google it. It's really solidify the lesson. Uh, worms eye view. Image. Horizon line is non-existent on the canvas. We don't see the horizon line at all. And then there is worms eye view that where we see the horizon line pretty close. So this is considered the horizon line right here. The horizon line doesn't always have to be the end of the earth. It could be the lowest object in the image horizon line is completely invisible in the severe, severe worm's eye view where you're trying to show the colossal perspective of something. And this is three-point perspective. And then we have bird's eye view. Just remember it's, it's the relation of the object. <clears throat> bird's eye view, the horizon line is really, really high because you're seeing the full extent of the length of the uh, of the earth or the, or the, the, the curvature of it. You're so high you see the curvature of the earth. Of course we don't actually see it from this height. We have to be like on the last atmospheric level of the earth. Um, I don't think that's how you spell it. Curvature. Okay. This is pretty much the, the worm's eye view where the horizon line is way beneath you and somewhere in the middle. It doesn't have to be all the way high in the canvas, it's just relative to the object. If there's no object, then it's just a simple matter of com um, balancing your negative and positive space and where you place the horizon line, if the horizon line is the POI, the point of interest. Okay, that, that's out of the way, I hope that was thorough. Um, let's talk about scale. So let's say this person is, uh, see I can't, unless I have unless I have three-point perspective, so unless I have the the little boobies and then you have the little tree like this and then you have the evil monster and then you have its hands kinda like overshadowing the image that's the only way really for us to r lower the, the, the lower it almost out of perspective, lower it out of the image The, the horizon line. So we would have to be on a three-point perspective. Right here you are, you are on two-point perspective, if, uh, if at all. And um, there's really very little we can do with this other than raise the horizon line. Shrink the tree and make it feel like a more colossal, shrink everything. Shrink everything in comparison to this and that's what scale is. Scale is size comparison in the image. Size relativity, size um, juxtapositioning, uh, comparison. So it means that if we have this massive object and this object that we're using beside it is an object we are very familiar with, so let's say it's a tree or a person, we know what, what the size of people are, five foot to six foot average, 
we know that if this is six feet, oh my god, if this guy was, you know, this big and he's taking up all this space on the canvas, and I'll get to that in a second, it means that this guy must be huge by comparison. If we drew the human to be this big and you're trying to tell me that it's as big as Godzilla, well, this must, this person is either massive or this is not Godzilla. So scale is size comparison. So what you need to do is shrink the tree so that this feels like a bigger, more evil object. Don't tell me, well, I really didn't want it to be very large. I wanted it to be of medium size. How convenient <laughs> that it's, it is of medium size. Um, <laughs> suddenly in the, in, the, in the critique. And I'm not saying you, you refuted the critique. I'm just saying use some of these rules. They're really going to help you. They're going to be like, what? This feels awesome. I really feel this. Um, and the next thing is, why is the canvas so perfectly matching and framing this object? I was like losing my words for a sec. <coughs> Excuse me, I really have to cough. Okay, I think I'm like using up all my energy. But uh, what you want to do is you don't want them centered perfectly in the image. This is bad photography because that the crosshair is so perfectly in the center. Symmetry sometimes is really, really screw and boring. And what you want to do is create some asymmetry, which gives a sense of an unstable cameraman kind of trying to fit the object in. So if you've ever seen the the Godzilla movies, any of the Jurassic Park movies, some of the I mean Steven Spielberg is a total asshole when it comes to filming. He's so solid and, and brick like and stiff. I really don't look at his work for impact. But have you ever seen the um, uh, movie? Uh, what's it called? Cloverfield. Oh my God! I love the way they create that 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 unstable. Oh fuck! What is that massive creature? How do I fit it in my camera? That's all canvas work right there. That's all amazing shit you guys can learn and add to your visual library. Look at how the canvas shifts every time he tries to fit that large object in the image. So if you make this object so large that we can't even tell what it is until we look close enough, but you give us just enough information so that we can see, maybe we see some of its claws over here and some of its eyes and then we see the tiny, tiny little tree and we see it kind of just like snaking down and we see a high horizon. Um, or a low horizon if you guys want to do all of this in, in two point pers I mean three point perspective. And the horizon is really low and this crazy creature is snaking down on everybody. Um, that's an even more immersive canvas that has amazing level of impact. Now imagine this big snake creature and imagine atmospheric fade added to that. Imagine blur in the distance and high level of detail in here. Imagine um, uh, artifacts flying around, wind, other things that create a sense of atmosphere. You are creating a world after that. So you got to think about yourself as a cameraman, as much as the artist and the renderer and the creator. You guys have to, I mean, look, look at it this way. I don't, I, if you don't believe in God, just see it as, you know, a metaphor. God created everything, in my opinion, <laughs> for this metaphor. And then, and then we are the cameraman through which we see everything. Isn't that amazing? I don't know. I'm sorry. I think I'm drunk off the medicine. But we are the cameraman. Our eyes are what, with what... Our, our eyes are how we behold the universe. So if you think about the eyes and the cameraman and the canvas and how our eyes are always forming canvases, our eyes are the, the edges of the canvas. This is our viewpoint. So if you always try to Im immerse yourself in the image, I am the viewer. I am who is seeing this massive universe. You won't forget about the impact of a low horizon or a high horizon the object relative to its placement. You won't forget about three-point perspective. You'll realize, holy crap, everything that I see, I have to duplicate it. All that physics, all those lines, all that underwiring, I have to I have to duplicate all of that. Um, in this image, I have to make sure that I constantly make the viewer feel like these are my eyes and this is what I saw and I'm coming back and telling them the story. That's amazing storytelling and that's with the power of composition. If you guys forget about that stuff and just draw, oh, let me throw in a, a, a very basic uh, horizon line. I'll just draw a biggish object on that horizon line and a tiny little object. And everything's going to be symmetrical and I'm going to even put a tree on either side and a rock on either side. I'm sorry. But this is extremely symmetrical and extremely boring. Where is the asymmetry? Where is the instability of the camera? Where is the colossus? Where is the, 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 the small object to be destroyed? Where is the focal point? Um, and that's all beside 
all of that stuff is on a whole other universe and then there's there's simple anatomy there's the anatomy of the object the anatomy of the tree is extremely boring even the tree had two sides to it had two main branches and these trees here, they are in the foreground, so for depth we need these to be darker and way more detailed because this is something in the foreground. And when did they, like, you know, it's way too symmetrical. When did the photographer find the perfect amount, of, the, the perfect spot to take a picture of this, of this little demonic uh, hellmouth opener dude? <clears throat> so bring in a little bit of asymmetry. Think about the power of your horizon line. Uh, remember what you're trying to, what are you trying to say? We as, you as the God, you are the God, and I am the viewer. And I am what with which, I am that which sees your, your wonders. So direct mine eyes to see thine wonders properly. All right? Let me look at what you guys are saying. The position of the horizon and the object relating to that horizon is important for the composition. Um... Is this the scene you were thinking about? Uh, no, well, a little bit, because he's a little bit higher. And no, this is more of an eye-level scene. So this was more of a holy shit, I have a Tyrannosaurus right in front of me kind of scene. This is why I say Steven Spielberg and anyone related to him, and whoever was in charge of these movies, um, was just complete ass crack and very stiff and very boring and very rigid with their, for the, their cinematics. Um, Cloverfield monster scene. You'll see what they did with Cloverfield. Uh, if I can find that awesome scene right here. So we first see that object, low horizon, object in the distance, freaking the crap out of everybody. Um, and then there's that, look, barely fitting in the camera. And it's just like, oh my god, we don't need anything else. And this is like, this is it. And we're staring right into the eyes of hell. There's this scene, again, low horizon line, high object, low, um, lesser object. In the foreground, more detail, atmospheric fade, casting that object in the distance. Um, there is another scene, I think it's this one, is this Cloverfield? I think it's this one, yeah. So this is the exact thing that I drew for you when I was drawing over your image earlier. You can just add the boobs on. Um, this is what I mean when you try to fit in the camera, show its claws, maybe throw the little tree in here with some three-point perspective. You can see the three-point perspective here. Um, and that would be a full composition. I argue with anyone now who says this is not a properly, this is not a solid composition here. Everything is pointing to it. Not everything has to follow the golden ratio. Sometimes all we need is, uh, what the hell is this? Um, all we need, sorry, all we need is the, uh, is, is the relativity, the, the size and scale and depth, and we have a composition. Sometimes we don't need all that fancy schmancy uh, renaissance kind of organization for our paintings. Not everything is going to be a, a masterpiece. Sometimes we just want to do cinematics, and we want to be movie directors. Tilting the canvas also is a really awesome way to create instability as well. So don't forget about that. Write that down. Uh, Cloverfield is just, it's a beautiful movie. Uh, claw, not a three-fingered arm like the other shot. Clearly, um, is learning its weight on its, leaning its weight on its front legs, which is, um, on this monster are claws rather than arms. People have so much time. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the thing that fell in the camera like you see it falling in the home video that he made not a home video but like anyways I'm, I'm losing I'm, I'm not thinking straight anyways um but yeah everything has its place uh ideally you'd, you'd do away with the horizon line and be looking up at the skeleton demon monster thing from the tree or somewhere yeah you never want to be a camera uh, an omnipotent cameraman show some weakness to the cameraman, show some weakness to you because you are the cameraman, you are the eyes uh, that behold the creation. So you are a weak creation <laughs> um, beholding other creations. So you want to be showing that weakness, the smallness, the rigid, the, 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 the looseness, the asymmetry. I mean, listen guys, if <laughs> imagine all we did was try to make everything that we look at symmetrical, like we try to make it symmetrical in our eyes. That's like OCD. I think that's like pos I think there's people who do that. They have to look at you and balance you in their eye vision, like in their in their line of sight, symmetrically with everything else in the room. Like they're really weird. 
um, like that. They, I think I'm like that because I've organized my whole house very symmetrically, so I need to get myself checked out. But uh, let's see what this person's saying. I know you don't like anime. Who said I don't like anime? Who's saying I don't? Who's going around telling people I don't like anime? I love anime. I just don't like seeing it when people think that they can bring an anime technique and principle into, into illustration and realism. I'm sorry, there has to be a line, a cut line. Do it gracefully. Don't overlap lines with edges. That's all I'm saying. Well, who's going around telling people I don't like anime? Ah, I fucking love anime. That's where I started off. I fucking love anime. I do anime all the time. I'm sorry, I'm starting so much. I, 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 I do anime. I am anime, okay? I love anime. So, so please, guys, stop saying I don't like anime. I, I do. <laughs> but yes, this is a perfect example of uh, the object not fitting in the canvas, large to small, three-point perspective, um, uh, depth, depth loss. Let me show you a fucking, like, oh my god, it just brings me to tears. Uh, Feng Hua Elephant Images. Come on, baby. Yeah, right here. Um, Feng Hua Zhang. There we go. Look at that. Low horizon. Very, very low. Almost a little bit on the canvas. Object relative to the horizon is much higher. Three point perspective and look at that atmospheric fade. This image makes me cry. It makes me question my role as in, in life. It, it just it makes me want to give up. But then I see the seams and then I'm like, it's okay, keep trying. But uh, think like this. This is epic scale. Oh, trust me, you want epic scale. There's never a time when you don't want epic scale. Okay? Let's see what everybody's saying. That free Medicare kicking in. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, uh, TFW is, to, is, a, is an anime. I am an anime. What does TFW mean? To, 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 for the win? But you wrote it wrong? This does not clog today. Yeah. <laughs> It's because I took it's because I took Dayquil and Sudafed. Those things are amazing, you guys. Um, uh, you do know image. Google has a search by image function, right? Oh man, I don't know any of that stuff. Listen, it's good enough that I know how to turn on my computer. I'm really old, so, <laughs> so you guys should be happy. I know how to I know how to program Broadcaster and be live right now. Um, just to confirm for Ramel. Know your role, this stuff. <laughs> uh, ugh, the stream froze for me. Oh no, did it freeze for everyone else? Hey, that's Wukong in the foreground. <laughs> yeah, it's the Monkey King. Wukong is based off the Monkey King. Uh, what's the name of that artist? Feng Hua Zong. The name of the artist is Wu Tang Clan. <laughs> <laughs> Granny Esther feeds us with your art cookies. I'm only 25, but <laughs> I have a really, really aged mind. I'm really, um, <laughs> I'm really like, I feel old. That's why I, I can't be bothered to learn new stuff. I can't even, I, I cannot believe I learned League. I, how did I learn League? How did I learn like the QWE and, and, and the mechanics, the basic mechanics? Like, how did I learn it? I, I have like I have really bad motor skills. <laughs> Is that what they are? Motor skills? I don't know. <clears throat> uh, just drag and drop the image you want to search for in the search bar, and you get results for different sizes and such. Oh, you mean reverse image search? Yeah, I know about that. Hey, Esta, how are you doing? Thank you, Klingzor. I'm doing very well. How are you doing? Gosh, how does someone sound so young? Someone so young. Gosh, how does someone? so young so much <laughs> I'm 36 and I'm struggling with like shading a cube um, learning by doing it still frightens me with her aggressive league play <laughs> um, I don't know why I thought you were older dang because I because I'm really old like right I told you I have like an old old self I'm like old <laughs> you should warm your hands 
Ista, what monitors are you using? Color calibration uh, necessary, what do you think? I'm using these really old HP monitors. Um, let me let me look it up. HP monitor 2007. Okay, this this is what I'm using. <laughs> it's a clanky old ass thing, but it does the job. It's got great colors. Um, you guys can search up the specs on that. That's one of them. That's the big one that I have, and then I have the smaller one. It just came with my computer when I bought it, like the first time I got paid off commission. I'm just like, yo, I'm buying myself a computer. Oh, I was so young. So young. That was like four years ago, but whatever. That's ba that's basically what I'm using. I don't use anything else. It does the, does the job. Um, IPS screens. School base. I like the Dell monitors. Yeah, I'm an old soul. So, um, we still have some time. You guys want an eye lesson? <clears throat> you guys want a lesson in eyes and stuff? Basically, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you guys, what do you find hardest about the eyes? Now, I can't cover everything, so y'all have to agree on something, and then I'll talk about it. We, we will all talk about it. Okay. I need some water. Let me just get my water. You talk amongst yourselves and figure out what you want me to talk about. <coughs> Sculpting the socket. Really, really good, good topic. How do you do them correctly and make them so they have life and character? Uh, the moisture of the eye, the lower eyelid, maybe the brow, uh, like different types of eyes. Not making them look uncanny valley. Getting the shape down is hard for me. Uh, the tear ducts. Oh my lord. Oh my lord. Okay, let me just uh, screen cap this. Oh fuck, did I close green shot? I did. Green shot. Stop typing, everybody, please. <laughs> so that I could, uh, uh, I can get them. Symmetry. Okay, I'm going to screenshot these and then save as desktop. Save. And I'm going to go through these one by one. Uh, I'm going to try. Alright. So someone said sculpting the eye socket. Here we go. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, Alright. <clears throat> The most important thing about the eye socket is that you remember that it's on a skeletal level. The eye socket is skeleton. It's not flesh. It's not skin. It's not eyeball. It's all skeleton. If you get that down first, you create a good base. Skeleton is what unites the entire universe, the entire, I'm sorry, the entire human race. Um, because we are at the skeletal level are like there is no distinction between us. There are minor distinctions. Someone can recreate a face by looking at a skeleton if they're trained to. But at the skeletal level, um, animals, mammals, any kind of creature um, relative to their uh, species are all the same. So if you understand the basic skeletal level of humans, um, and actually look up a skeleton and actually study a skeleton, you will never mess up with the eye socket. On the skeletal level, there is a tiny depression in between the eye sockets, and there's a massive depression of the eye sockets. And what you have to do, the most important shadow of the eye sockets, is right here, because that is where it is deepest. So let me bring out my resources for class. And minor depression darkest part of the entire eyeball. Minor depression, darkest part. This should be the darkest part. You guys forget, you guys bring in all kinds of light. You guys bring in this value all the way down here like you can. No, you can't. On the skeletal level, you have to remember there are brush strokes early in the f first five minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes of your painting. You got to make sure those brush strokes are dedicated to the skeleton. What did I just say? Repeat it back to all right. <clears throat> Skeletons unite the entire universe. Time to get spoopy. 
Uh, yeah, that's the area I struggle with, with the most. Well, there's a difference depending on the gender, but I think the slight difference is based on nationality. But details, details. Um, very minor details. Uh, you would not notice them kind of details, Mimi. You have to be like, you have to take a science course for like, and forensics for like 10 years before you notice those details. Not 10 years, I'm exaggerating. Skeleton makes the base darker part in between the eyes, darkest part of the inner eye corner. Deep part of the orbit is the darkest part of the eye. Gotta keep your early brush strokes catering to the skull. Very nice, Esma. Your early brush strokes are all skeleton, all day. Now, someone else said, what did, what did you guys say? So, um, sculpting the socket symmetry, I'll talk about that. The shape, uh, the moisture of the eye, lower eyelid, I'll talk about these two next. So we have the eyeball. So on the eyeball, any sphere, three-dimensional, an open space, and an open space. So we're going to call this box the universe. Oops, they fuck me. Right, and the, and the sphere is in this in this universe. Any open any object in open space with light cast upon it will have a shadow. Nothing is exempt from this. Neither the eyeball, nor the ball in the eyeball, nor the tiny balls on the tiny eyeball, and nor the every single tiny hair on that eyeball, um, or the little uh, boils that are spewing pus that come out of that eye. Everything has a shadow. And when you think about the layers of skin that wrap around the eyeball itself, um, they are not, they don't cancel out shadows because they're just something else in front of something else. They inherit the shadows. So this is the, this is the core rule. Um, any object that wraps around that is wrappable, any malleable object around us, uh, wrapped around a solid object will inherit its shadows. So let's say this whole ball here is wrapped around with silk. The silk is going to inherit the shadows of here, of, of the sphere. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to get a shadow and draw some shades under on the eyelids because that's what happens. The eyelids are the silk wrapping around the ball of the eye. Now for the upper eyelid, any object in front of another object in an open space will cast a shadow upon it if the light is in front of the object A. So this means that the upper eyelid casts a shadow on the rest of the eyes. Alright, so my brush is really large, I'm not doing any crazy stuff, and already the eye is taking a lot of shape because we're thinking on a really large scope. We're thinking on a scope that surpasses detail. We are taking care of the frame, the basic wiring, the basic three-dimensional uh, laws that apply to the largest objects in the room, in that open space, that cube of open space. So this is a very stylized eye, so I kind of have to work with the amount of blacks you used. Then there's anatomy. So we just did a lot of shape stuff. There's anatomy. Sometimes uh, you have to learn more, a little bit more anatomy before you notice a difference. Even after you learned a bunch about um, form and form structure, your, your, your images are still going to look really um, uh, kind of lacking because you haven't yet done the anatomy part of that improvement. So this means that you have to learn some of the stuff that happens with the eye anatomically. So it's no longer about shapes and spheres. So this means that you need to add to your visual library the waterline of the eye. Very basic. So let's see how we add moisture, because someone was talking about moisture. Moisture is added when you think about areas of the eye structure that are essentially moist. So the whole eyeball is moist, or else it wouldn't be able to pivot and move around and, and observe and do as it's supposed to. Um, these areas are all lubricated and the whole eye is wet, so it's going to have a higher contrast uh, margin than anything else in the face. Uh, these areas are as follows. The eye water line needs an extra level of illumination just along where the light is traveling, so the, to the direction of the light, that's where the light, sh that's where it should sit. And then we've got the fact that there is lots and lots and lots of water on the whites of the eye. This means that when something is placed in water, um, it becomes distorted, its details become distorted. 
And as for Shauna's question, how do you add life to the eye? This is how you add life. This is the moisture levels, the shadows, all of that stuff. That's all real life. Work from the largest object, largest brush stroke, and work your way down. And then depending on the eye light is pretty much that that specular light is where you where you get the most life into the eye and you have to make sure you place it in the perfect spot. And eye is also uh, can can be shadowed so you want to shadow the upper part of that eye. And then wherever the light is traveling, wherever that relief point is from the cast shadow of the upper eyelid, that's where that eyelid eye light sits. Sometimes it's up here because it's reflecting off something else. So let me look at the general kind of image we're looking at here. Um, would light be able to bounce up here? Sometimes you can cheat. Sometimes you can just place it there because it looks nice. But that's never really enough for me. I kind of want to keep it close to the relief point where the light actually can reach. And it can run over the black. It's not always beside the black of the eye, the pupil. It can just sit right on top of it. There's keeping the pupil itself sharp. And then finally, this is all technique now. So that was anatomy. We started with form and now it's technique. Technique is in the fact that you do not use black. Work your way from grays down into blacks. Your largest shades should be the grays and your smallest shade your least used shade should be the black and that's how you create depth everything is a gradual movement into those blacks you have more grays than you do black right grays are better this means that you will create more depth because everything is always emerging from a low point and that is like depth that's like what you do with with uh, with landscapes sorry I need to cough one sec Okay, um, there is the fact that skin is very different when it comes to the eye. So there's all that skin in that area and how skin folds. So where does the eyeball of the lower eye in the lower eyelid area stop and where does the, the face begin? And that also brings life in. So edges, edges in the anatomy, get familiar with those. Um, another way to add life is in the eyebrows, making sure the eyebrows are not like scow's brows that are used. Then there's adding reflectivity, so um, making sure the, the the light can reflect on reflective material on the face, and that adds more life. Then there's cast shadows that you don't really think about. You're not really thinking about these important, important cast shadows. And you keep adding this stuff, you'll eventually have a Pixar anime Frozen Girl kind of kind of eyeball. It's really very very easy. The anatomy of the eye also calls for pinks in the inner water line. That's going to add another, you know, plus points for, for life. Plus life points. So there's going to be a little bit of pink on the inner part of the eye. And there's going to be a little bit of water and pinks on the inner water line. The water line doesn't need that much, or the tear duct doesn't need that much rendering. That was another thing you guys asked for. It just needs a little bit of, of, of illumination and a spike in the contrast just to say, hey, there's a lot of water collected here and it's kind of reflecting off just as a, 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 a drop of water would. March down, march down. You guys, if you memorize this, uh, by all means, means add a pair of boobs and, and, uh, and uh, a vagina, <laughs> you're well on your way to being a uh, Sakimi Chance competition. Everyone loves that anime realism hybrid. <clears throat> right, another way to add life is remembering makeup. That's another big massive thing when it comes to eyes. You, you, most of the time you're all drawing makeup. You don't know you're doing it, but you're drawing makeup. So give in. Learn some real, real life makeup tips and makeup rules and use them to your advantage as you paint. So if this was me, I'd probably get that smoky eye going just to add to that black that's too much and then get a little bit of this red and throw it over the eye and this is exactly what I would do uh, if I was working on, on someone's face for makeup 
I would just get the red to unify. Like if she had red hair, I actually did work on someone who had red hair. If she had red hair, uh, I would bring in lots of red into her eyeshadow because so, so quickly that makeup separates the hair color and makes it feel unnatural. I'd bring a little bit of eyeshadow into her eyebrows because again that would reinforce the, the natural palette, make her eyes, uh, her whole face seem more natural. Even though her hair is an unnatural color and that doesn't really happen. Like a really, really sharp red. I'm not talking about orange. Um, then there's keeping your brush large, making sure you have the, uh, the basic illuminations, making sure you have um, good sculpture, uh, good sculpting, the three quarters, the four quarters of the face are separated properly. I'm kind of really overdid it with the eyeshadow, but whatever. Making sure you have reflective light, reflected light traveling across the face, areas that have been reflected. It's a very rough job and doing it really fast. But all of this stuff adds to making an eye feel more realistic and more believable and have more life. You can go and do this and this will add more life to it. Just like that and that'll add a little bit more believability. And I'm just working with what you did here with the um, with the eye size. It's kind of big, a bit large and cliche for my taste, but uh, learn the basics, and I guess after that, start customizing and deviating more to the organic patterns. Uh, bye bye, Kings Kingzor Klingzor. <clears throat> um, let me see what you guys are saying. Mr. Brack, will today's lesson be uploaded? They're always uploaded. I didn't upload the last lesson, I don't think. Did I? Oh, fuck, I didn't upload the Tuesday's lesson. I'm so sorry. I'll upload it. Uh, hi, by the way, Mr. Brack, did you go to art school? I did not. Thank God I did not. Um, are the whites of the eye too white? Yes, please do not let the eyes, the whites of the eye be too white. Okay? Don't do any eye whites. Um, uh, eyelashes to make the. Uh, I think when it comes to eyelashes, just uh, keep it small to large, moving out to the outer corner, and keep it uh, clumped and released and dispersed as as it would in randomly in real life. Um, um, Heterochrome says, "Mr. Rex, so basically the shadowing of face." Uh, is uh, can be rethought as putting a separate surface on a skull. Um, yeah, like a layer of extra shadow on the skull. Yeah, skin of shadow, call it. If, if that helps you draw better and, and imagine it better and remember it better, by all means, think of it like that. An extra layer. Um, hello, meerkat, meeract, meeract. Um... Uh, that looks some um, videos up advice is terrible as it doesn't help at all suffering and looking like fool does uh, The hair looks pretty nice. Yeah, the hair is done really nicely amazing job. Uh, they just make me feel inadequate Oh, I'm jealous as hell get to work for shizzle off you go <laughs> Brian Daz it is the moment uh, that I want to high-five you He runs off a cliff in excitement <laughs> So that's it. I covered a lot of technical and uh, basic knowledge today. Um, I hope it helped. I really just want to shrink the eyes. They're just so big. I'm getting so sick of that Barbie doll look and everything. She'll feel way more old and mature once I shrink the eyes. and look much more appealing and cute and uh, kind of realistic once you shrink the eyes. Give her less of a... Give her more chin and more jawline. And she'll look a lot cuter. The symmetry is basic, you know, make both sides look the same. So for ever, whoever asked about symmetry, just make both sides look the same. Um, and uh, I do recommend blending this, this part of the lip with the rest of the skin because it will not match. It will feel very off. Make the upper lip a little darker. Right along here. And then bring some of the basic skin tone down on this lip. 
Dark spots should be gradual halos. They should not be, um, let me just sharpen that. They should not be dark dots. Okay, before, after. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>